All right. Welcome back to a, another episode of the Wire to Hunt podcast brought to you by First Light and their Camo for Conservation initiative. This whole initiative means that a portion of every sale of First Light Spectre Camo pattern, which is the whitetail pattern that Tony and I wear out there all season long, if you buy anything with that pattern on it, a portion of that sale is going to go to the National Deer Association, which I'm a fan of. Now, Today, we've got a different kind of episode for you. I've got my buddy Tony Peterson with me to help with this. And here's the idea. I kind of want to set the stage for the conversation we're going to have here. Kind of lay out my my pitch, I suppose, for you. And then, and then we'll see where it goes. But here's the idea. The pitch I have, the concept I want to consider today is this idea. This idea that if you want to be the best possible deer hunter you can be, you need to do other things than deer hunting. If you want to have specialist level success as a deer hunter, you know, what we assume a specialist has, which is like the the very most deer hunting success you could get. If you want to have that kind of success, you actually need to be more of a generalist. So this is kind of a backwards thought here, but this is this argument that I have, this I, something that Tony and I have kind of dabbled around the edges in past conversations, but today I really want to focus on this idea that to get better deer hunting, to have more success, to have more satisfaction with this thing that we talk about every week, we actually want to and should diversify our activities and our year. We actually should think about adding in more seasonality to what we're doing. We should actually consider some changes in pace. We need to invest in different kinds of activities that kind of spark our mind in different ways, that challenge us in different ways, and all of this kind of stuff. By stepping away from your standard way of thinking about deer hunting, the standard deer hunting things we do, it will actually come back around and help us. That's the pitch. That's the idea that I want to consider here. Tony, before I lay into like some of my inspiration for this, the first thing I want to know from you is, does any of this resonate? Like, th- does this seem like something that makes sense to you or do I sound like I'm off my rocker? <laughs> no, man, I've, I've been pushing this message more and more probably the last four or five years as I just realize it about myself that, you know, I've, I like a lot of people who are listening to this and I know you have it's easy to go real deep on wanting to be the best whitetail hunter ever. And I'm only going to scout whitetails. I'm only going to think about whitetails. I'm only going to hunt whitetails. And it, I don't think it makes, I I don't think that's the recipe to make a good hunter in in a lot for a lot of people. And I think that being a generalist and being interested in other stuff, not just outdoor activities, not just, we're not just talking fishing or pheasant hunting or whatever, but just having things that challenge you, that keep you working toward goals and kind of that, that intermittent progress. I just, I think it's, as I age, that becomes so much more evident to me how important that is. You know, it's just a long game thing. Yeah. And I think something that we'll probably come back around to, but that I've been thinking a lot about is this just idea of having like my whitetail mind always on in the background while doing different things. And so engaging in a lot of different activities, but having that whitetail whisper in the back of my mind that's whispering like, hey, this would actually work really good when you're making decisions as a deer hunter. Or, hey, this kind of skill set you're building is going to be very useful come October or November, whatever it is. And like just kind of having that awareness on at all times, even outside of deer hunting season, even when I'm doing something completely unrelated to deer hunting. I think it's important to kind of just have that awareness boiling in the back of your subconscious so you can pick and grab and choose and remember these different things or jump on these little opportunities when they arise. Um, I think all of that stuff helps build this, this next level deer hunting ability, I guess. I guess here's one thing that I've thought about. There's like different levels or stages of growth as a deer hunter that I think I've experienced at least. And I I imagine most people have this. You've got that first stage where you're just trying to figure out like, what the hell am I doing? Right. Where you just need like a foundation of what is this stuff I'm looking at? What are these things I'm trying to do? Where do these things live? How do they operate? Like you have to have a base level amount of knowledge. Right. And then there's like the second tier 
which is like a big one where like, how do I become good at this stuff? Like, how do I really understand the nuance? How do I really get to the 201, 301, 301 level stuff? Like this is that stage where people go from just killing deer to like, how do I consistently kill, you know, older deer? All right. And I think a lot of people maybe stop there, but then there's this next level that I think there's probably two ways to go about getting there. I think there's one level where there's the person who just wants to be the specialist, the guy or girl who says, I'm doing nothing else but deer hunting. I'm going to spend 10,000 hours becoming an expert in this thing. And this is the only thing. And that, that might be one way to do it. Like I, I, can, I can point to some examples of that. But I guess what I want to talk about today is a different way to get there, which is this, this way of, of pulling in from the outside world that will then help you on in this inside whitetail world become better. And so part of this, this is a long roundabout way of getting to what I want to say here, Tony, but there's a book I've been reading. It's called range by David Epstein. You ever heard of that? Mm -mm. So the, the book here is, I mean, it's right about what we're talking about here. The book's called range. Why generalists triumph in a specialized world. And the general thesis here is that there's, if we were to oversimplify, there's kind of two different ways or environments within this world that we live in that you could break things up. There's something that they refer to, some studies that point to kind learning environments. And kind learning environments or kind learning activities are the kinds of things where, um, you know, there are clear rules, there are clear patterns. Um, there's very immediate and clear feedback and you can then, you know, operate in an environment like that or in an activity like that and very clearly understand, okay, this is what you're supposed to do. I do the thing, it worked or it didn't work. And then I adjust. This would be stuff like chess. This would be stuff like, um, solving math problems. This is stuff like, uh, golf. I don't know, different activities like that. And then there's what, you know, Epstein makes the argument in his book. Um, there's a different kind of a learning environment, which is where the world is trending more and more now. He originally speaks to the fact that kind of the old world was was more of like that kind learning environment, like working in a factory. It's like you take this thing, you put it in this hole and you move it down the line, right? It's like, just do this, do this, do this, and move it down. And now we're moving into a new kind of world, which is what they call a wicked learning environment. And a wicked learning environment, I'm just going to read you the quote here. A wicked learning environment are these activities where patterns are harder to discern and feedback is delayed or inaccurate. Uh, information is hidden. Even when it isn't, feedback may be delayed. It might be infrequent. It may be non-existent. It may be partly accurate or inaccurate. So sometimes in wicked learning environments, the wrong types of behavior are reinforced. What does that sound like to you? That sounds like deer hunting. Right. Well, it kind of sounds like war, but it also sounds like deer hunting. Yes. <laughs> yes. Kind of sounds like war, but like if, if we're, if we're saying like which one of these two buckets does deer hunting fit into, man, it is not chess. Like I know we like to say like, oh, deer hunting is a chess no. game, but it's not at all. Right. We don't get to see no. all the pieces on the table. We don't get, we try something and we don't know if this is the right thing. Right. How many well, times have we talked about asking why, and we try to figure out the why something happened, but we never really know. Right. There's no clear feedback. There's no accurate feedback all the time. Um, we're dealing with a tremendous amount of uncertainty. Yeah. We well, say the, the rules change all the time and we don't know until it's way too late. Yeah, exactly. And so, so the argument in this book is that wicked learning environments favor a generalist approach. It favors not a specialized narrow field of knowledge and expertise, but a broader uh, base of knowledge to pull from because it allows something called lateral thinking. So the simplified version of what lateral thinking is just like being able to connect disparate ideas, being able to take an idea from one world and apply it to another, taking a concept from one realm and pulling it into your world, like combining different things in creative ways, problem solving, right? And that I think is what we're kind of trying to get at today. I okay. think that I mean, do you, does this make you think? Cause immediately what this makes me think of is guys like Andy May and Zach Farrenbaugh who've hunted whitetails in so many different environments where that, that, you know, maybe on paper don't seem like they'd be all that connected, but because of the experience doing it over and over in different places, it just becomes easier everywhere. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of what this does the, the, the studies that I'm reading about in this book and some others, it, it, 
it puts language to and validation to some ideas that we've kind of thought, we, we, we've believed, like we've talked about this a lot, right? You and I have talked about the importance of hunting new places, doing new things, you know, trying new approaches and how all of that, you know, can make you a better deer hunter. And I think this is pointing to, man, there's like higher level studies and higher level stuff going on here that points to, yeah, that being true, whether it be diversity in your deer hunting or diversity in everything you're doing. And, and again, like being able to pull from all of those different places, being able to pull from all those different activities, strengthening these different muscles, hypoth- like metaphorical muscles, mental and physical in some cases, um, and how all of that comes back and helps you as a deer hunter. Like the thing is like, if you just do the same thing over and over and over again, if you just hunt the same way over and over and over to a degree, you'll get better at that thing for a while, uh, but there's that plateauing, right? And we don't leave, live in a static deer hunting world, right? Things are always changing around us. The habitat's changing, uh, hunting pressure's changing. There's all sorts of things that can go haywire. Uh, if you're not able to stay up on that, if you're not too able to adjust with the times, if you're not able to be just as dynamic as you know, the wild world is, you're never going to enjoy the success that you probably could have otherwise. Um, and I, I want to say something on that because I think you're making a really good point. And I think this ties to what you said way at the beginning where you talked about having, no matter what you're doing, having this kind of uh, background noise of, of whitetail thought going because I just, just randomly, like two nights ago, I was laying in bed just about to start reading. And I started thinking about smallmouth. like where, what, what are the bass doing right now? And it kind of like my wife walked in and I, I was like, I'm going to ask my wife if she ever thinks about smallmouth any other time <laughs> than when I'm like, we should go. Fi-. Cause right. Like she fishes yeah. with us, you know, and like, we, we go up to the lake a lot. And so I'm like, does she, does it ever occur to her to think about smallmouth in March or, you know, April or whatever. So I asked her, I was like, in any given month when we're not like going to the lake, do you ever think about what those smallmouth are doing in our lake? And she looked at me and she was like, no. Like, why, why would I? And it just, it kind of like, it made me think about how often you talk to somebody who's a deer hunter, you know, like, and I'm kind of stereotyping here, but you know, maybe there's somebody who goes up for the the rifle opener and the, you know, up in the UP at the cabin or whatever for three days. And that's their hunt. They're probably not thinking about whitetails. Like what, what are, what are the deer doing up there in March? And, and I think that so when you talk about, you know, learning in this wicked environment that we're going to get into here and and becoming a generalist, I think one of the easiest things for you to do is to start thinking about this stuff more. Like just start, just put some mental horsepower to it. You, you can't always go out and scout. You can't always be a part of it in that world, but you can you, not even, not even necessarily e-scouting. You can be thinking about this more like, why do the deer do this? Or why do they do that? Like, I'll give you a quick example here before we move on. I, w- I took one of my daughters out to scout turkeys just like a week ago. And we went and sat and on this property we have permission on. And the, the owner has one redneck blind on this food plot. It's a great, it's a great setup to glass turkeys. <laughs> just, it just is, right? Yeah. So we went in there and sat and we watched a doe and a fawn and then three bucks come out, three shed bucks come out. And what they did was stare at that blind the whole time and feed in the corner of the food plot and kind of move off and browse and come back out. And then it got dark and they went past, but they, I was like, they're still avoiding this blind. And like, it kind of struck me as like, you know, when you hunt there, like I hunted their muzzleloader season and of course the deer are super cagey because they've been hunted out of there a whole bunch. But in my brain, that sort of shut off once the season ended, like mm-hmm. I just assumed they would get real comfortable again, but we were talking almost, you know, almost four, well, three and a half months out from the gun season or the end of the bow season. And those deer are still like, that's the danger spot. And it kind of made me realize like, I wasn't thinking about that correctly, but they are like, they're still like, we don't want to get close to there, even though we haven't had any negative interactions with that in months it's still ingrained in there. And it kind of, it was kind of an eye opener to me. Well, there's this kind of this thing that happens when you put yourself in a different environment. In this case, you were kind of in the same environment, but a different kind of year or a different time of year, right? right. It's like if you allow yourself to, to go into a different place and a different set of circumstances and then kind of circle back to deer hunting while you're in that different place, it like 
makes new things fire. It makes new yeah. ideas pop out. Um, uh, I mean, this is like a thing in writing. I'm sure in like all sorts of creative, creative endeavors, right? When people have like writer's block or people are struggling to write something new or paint a new picture or whatever it is, like a, a common practice is to, you got to shake things up. You got to put yourself into a new environment. You need to, you know, create something new in your environment mentally or physically to then, you know, get your body and brain thinking differently. And so I think that same thing applies. So it's like, in your case, scouting turkeys, hunting turkeys, whatever, you had this pseudo epiphany because you were in the deer hunting world, but in a different time. I think similar things might happen like when you're out smallmouth fishing. I bet you when you're out smallmouth fishing, there will be moments when you're out there fishing and then all of a sudden you're like, man, this is a lot like what deer do. And it's kind of funny because I realized that smallmouth are, re- 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 you know, adjusting to this rock pile in a certain way. And that's just how a buck is going to use structure when he's traveling. I don't know what it is, but like there's probably these different like analogous things that we can see or understand more clearly from our deer hunting world when we look at them through the lens of something different. And that's, I think that's like the whole thing that I'm hoping we can get at here today is like how we can do that a little bit better. Um, or examples of how we've done that at least. And maybe that's useful for other folks. Well, it, can we, can we go down that little smallmouth rabbit hole for a second? Yeah. Cause I think one of the things that I've learned after fishing, you know, I've fished all over, but I fished one lake a lot and you know, when they school up in the summer where the schools are, but in, you know, like in my head, I go to this rock pile and if they're there, we catch them. If not, I move on to the next one and they'll be there. And when you start to break it down, you go, okay, they live in this, I don't know how, how big of an area. It's not a, not like a huge area, at least from spring through fall, but they're not necessarily on that rock pile, you know, post spawn to the, you know, getting their feed bags on in the fall. You'll find them on there sometimes, but sometimes they're just not there. They're over on that sand drop and it's, you know, cause a minnow hatch or the crayfish are molting or something. And I always think about that with whitetails. Cause we talk about them, like that buck beds in that swamp and he feeds in that field. And it's like, yeah, two out of every seven days, yeah. he probably does that. But there are so much, so many things going on that where it, that might've been affected by a predator might've been affected by hunters, or it just could be that they felt like going the other way and browsing or whatever. And we, we kind of try to boil this down to like, there's a simple solution to this, right? He, here's his bed. I know he uses this. I know he feeds in that alfalfa simple, but they don't follow that. Like they, that pattern is not like a day to day thing, especially if you get outside of that summer pattern bleeding into the fall season, you know, like if you get in past the first couple of weeks of the September season, you know, if you can hunt that, those patterns start to die real quick. Those deer didn't probably move, but they're not, they're not following what we think is like an A to B thing all the time. It's like so much more dynamic than that. So, so can you, you kind of said this, but give me a little more detail. What, what do you do when you go to that first rock pile and they're not there the way you were hoping they're going to be? What do you do after that? Go to the next most likely. So you always break it down. Like we're, we're looking for something quick. Give me, give me some kind of look, right? So we're throwing a top water. We're throwing a, a swim bait. We're not, we're not flipping jigs, dragging tubes. It's like fast. Give, give me a clue what's going on. You throw it over that rock pile 50 times and you don't get a blow up and nobody picks anything up. Then you're like, okay, now, now we need to change. Are they here and they're just not looking up? So we need to flip it, go through there again. Now you don't get bit and you're like, they're probably not here because they should be biting. The sun isn't up yet. The conditions are right. Then it's time to move. Or, you know, like it's, it's always, we, I know you see this a lot, but it's always like you have this idea. You're like, I'm going to go out and do this. They're going to eat this way, or I'm going to catch them this way, or I'm going to shoot a deer this way. And then you get out there and it's just never quite what you expect. You're out, you're making a million little decisions to just, because it's just, it just doesn't work that way. Like as much as we try to set it up to be like, they always come into the food plot and I always kill them on Halloween. Like, okay, well now you have an east wind and it's 85 degrees or whatever. Like it just doesn't work. Yeah. Well, what can, how useful would it be for someone to take that same approach you took when fishing for smallmouth, when they're not where they are, where the way where you wanted them to be in the first place take that same approach and apply that to deer hunting. There's probably a lot of folks that go and sit that same rock pile and then just sit it again and then sit it again and don't know why am I not seeing my deer here at the 
rock pile, right? But but take what you just learned about what works in smallmouth fishing, going to the next spot, testing a couple different things. If you don't see what you're looking for after those couple different tests, which might be a couple sits or looking for certain amounts of sign in these areas or whatever it is, the way you're testing the theory like you're talking about, and then moving to the next metaphorical rock pile. Like, that's a perfect example of doing a non-deer hunting thing and being able to recognize, oh, this is a thing that could be applied to deer hunting okay. that makes a lot of sense when you think about it that way. I'll do you one better on that because this this has really been hitting home for me the last couple of years. So if you if you think about what probably holds back most deer hunters, it's that you know, probably this is this is like the wired to hunt audience is probably a weird doesn't doesn't entirely apply to them, but general deer hunters want the hunt to happen where they want it to happen. Yeah. So they go to the stands they like, they go to the spots they like, and they cross their fingers and hope the hunt happens there. And when it doesn't, they try it again and they hope the weather brings them in or the seasonal timing or whatever. I see so many parallels when I'm out bass fishing to walleye fishermen that way, where it's hmm. like Early season, if you've got some current or something, you know, like they're going to be, they're going to be coming back from where they spawned and, and stopping at this point and this point before they get into their summer pattern out on the lakes. And, you know, then they're going to be on a mud flat or a drop off or some kind of reef or something. And so most of the walleye fishermen I see, they, they come out for three or four months and go to the same spots and they're like, they're either biting or they're not. So they're either eating the worms I'm dragging or the minnows on a jig or whatever, or they're not eating. Well, what I started noticing the last couple of years is this uh, like shiner hatch going on in August. And what happened is if I could find a bait ball, it's just like fishing in the ocean. Walleyes, northerns, and smallmouth are just following them around. And oftentimes they're pretty shallow and blown up on a windblown island or shore or whatever. So what's happening is walleye fishermen are going – the walleyes are out here. They're either in 10 feet of water, 20 feet of water, whatever. And if I, if I'm catching them, they're here. If not, they're here, but they're not biting. And I'm in a situation where I'm not looking for them. I, you know, it's bright sun, it's August, it's hot. They're in three feet of water, just gorging on this, you know, here today, gone tomorrow food source. So all it is, is like when you, when you're a whitetail hunter and you're like, I've got three stands, I hunt this farm <laughs> and you go out there over and over again. And you're like, once every 10 years, I get a shot at a big one. And it's like, the big ones are there. You got them on trail camera, you know, they're there. So what's wrong. You're not going to find them. You're, you're only, you're, you're hoping that it happens the way you want it to happen, but that's not how it works because they know that they know you want it to happen there. Cause that's where you always go. And I think we don't think about that. So we go, all right, well, I didn't kill him on the opener. I'm going to, I'm going to lay low during October. I'm going to come back in and he's going to, he's going to follow a doe in during the rut. And yeah, sometimes that happens, but to really be in the game, you have to look at it and go, if it's not happening for me, it's not because they're not here. You know, like it's, it's because they're avoiding me or they're doing something different. What is that? Like what, what, how can you solve that problem? And that's the parallel to all this stuff we're talking about is it's just like a series of problem solving over and over and over again. You know, so, yeah. So there's there's certain activities that we can do outside of deer hunting that will ha have that very direct crossover. Like any kind of fishing, I think, is very applicable. Any different type of hunting is very applicable. I think there's like, uh, oh heck, I don't know. Any kind of decision making based activity, anything that like really puts stress on you to make decisions under pressure, analyzing data. I mean, I know we said chess isn't a good comparison, but to a degree it is. It, there's like a certain amount of like predicting moves and, and strategic decision making, like that kind of thing. I think flex is a muscle that helps you make better decisions as a deer hunter. Um, there's another kind of line of activities that are not deer hunting related, but really help with a lot of deer hunting things. And it's something both you and I have talked about some in the past. We're both pretty active and now, and that's like running or physical fitness, different stuff like that. Right. Um, and we've, we've dabbled in this a little bit, but I think I find myself going deeper and deeper and deeper into this world and finding that a, I'm getting like more enjoyment out of it. And B I'm seeing how it's translating to the deer hunting world. The more I like allow myself to do that. You know what I mean? 
Talk um, big time. Yeah. So I think the last time we talked, I told you that I had signed up for that mountain trail run 30K, right? Mm-hmm. So I've been training for that. And then in training for that, I realized like, oh man, that thing's going to kill me. I need to have like a training race leading up to that. So now I'm signed up for another trail half marathon that's like middle of the road elevation game, but still a lot harder than anything I've done in the past. So that's coming up in a month. Um, And (laughs) I'm actually like realizing that something crazy happened. I don't don't know if you do this or not, Tony. Um, But for years, I've just been like a road runner. And then now I'm doing more and more trail running and, and now I'm actually like really enjoying it. Like before it was a thing I knew I should do and I did it and I, and I liked it, but I kind of didn't like where I was at, but now I'm finding places where I can like just be out in the woods, out in the hills or whatever. And that's just like fun, just being out there and noticing things. And I've actually been trail running in some places that I can deer hunt, the public land I can deer hunt. And I've been noticing like, oh man, like, look at that. Or I'm bumping deer off a little knoll. I'm like, huh, interesting how they're betting here. And so it's it's another interesting example of something that, you know, I know you preach all the time, which is just finding excuses to be in the woods, finding any kind of excuse to be out there. And you don't have to be dead set focused on deer, but just being out there, you have the opportunity to have these little aha moments. You have the opportunity to have these little discoveries. Um, and that's been popping up in my deer in my running now more than I originally expected. Well, I mean, look what you did there though. If you want to, if you want to talk about problem solving again, the first problem you have is just how do I become a runner, (laughs) which is a hard one for most people to solve. Yeah. And then you start that and you run on a treadmill or you run on the road and you're like, okay, I've, I've, I've gotten past the part where I'm of, of not being a runner to being a runner. And then, but you still struggle. Like, it's still not like every day you're like, I, I cannot wait to go running. I mean, there's a yeah. lot of times you're like this, I have, I have to solve for this daily to yeah. find this motivation or more likely the discipline. And then you, you're like, okay, how do I hold myself accountable? Well, if I sign up for this, I'm not backing out. And then yeah. you discover along the way, you're like, well, it's actually a hell of a lot more enjoyable to run through the woods than it is on yeah. the road. And that's yeah. a hell of a lot more enjoyable than running on a treadmill. Yeah. And so again, it's like, do something that challenges you at an incremental level that forces you to hold yourself accountable and it feeds into everything else. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. And that's exactly where I'm at now. I'm you, the thing you just spelled out was exactly my trajectory. Like that, I had like a, it was a struggle to get like motivated to put on the running shoes and go out for the run and do all that stuff years ago. And now like I am, legitimately excited about it every time. Like I'm looking forward to my next run. I'm looking forward to like a nine mile run with a bunch of elevation gain, something I thought I'd never would want to do. But that sounds like, man, that's going to be great. That's going to be the best part of my day. Um, And that just took like that incremental work. It took finding goals along the way. It took challenging myself to do these things. And it took like, how do I find the version of this that's enjoyable for me? Mm -hmm. And like you said, like that's a process. So you, you've actually gotten to a point because I, I, I feel like I don't know, with my running, I'm I'm kind of at a I'm at a weird spot with it. I'm running quite a bit and but I'm like it I do it because it makes me feel good when I'm done. <laughs> I'm not I'm not doing it because like during my runs I'm like I'm not super happy. Like it's okay. Like I'm I'm not I don't hate it, obviously. Yep. But it seems like you found it you're at a better place with it because not only are you you're anticipating it. You're, you're enjoying the process and I'm sure it makes you feel pretty good. You know, not getting another Andrew. good yep. run out at the end. Yeah. But I'm actually, yeah, now I'm actually in the moment, just enjoying it. And I think there's two things going on there. One is like, it's been years of building like a base. It kind of is back to the deer hunting trajectory, right? Like you have to have a long time of building that foundation to where you just get it right enough to now be creative with it and so in this case like the analogy of running for me it's like just building a running foundation so it doesn't hurt when you're running right so you can just like comfortably do it without it being miserable like i'm 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 enough of a runner now that it's not miserable to run um and then like the secret sauce more recently has been like this is like so obvious but like go in a pretty place where there's not a bunch of people and you don't need to worry about getting hit by a car um (laughs) what an aha moment that is and all of a sudden like my run, I'm just looking around like, man, this is beautiful. Like, I like to go hiking. I like to be outside hunting. Like, this is just 
being outside and getting a better workout. Um, that's like an easy win when you can make it enjoyable, make it good for you. And also like you are still building good habits that help you in so many other things too, right? Yeah. Discipline. Uh, well, for sure. And it, I don't, I don't know, but do you listen to podcasts when you run or do you listen to music or what? So I would say 50% of the time I listen to a podcast or audio book, I'm trying to do more just no sound and just like thinking. So I'm trying to, I'd say it's 50, 50 now, and I'm trying to encourage myself to do more no listening so that I can have that like open space to like think and, you know, have those like free association type moments happen. Yeah. I, I'm just curious. Cause I, when I, when I lift, I love to lift, listen to music, but I hate listening to podcasts. When I run, I like listening to podcasts, but I just, if I listen to music, I, I tend to just go in my head. Like I, I can't zone out and kind of take in the story or whatever, but I've also found there's been times where for whatever reason, I don't, you know, my, my headphones are dead or whatever, but I'm going running and I'll, I'll do that. And I'll be like, man, I'm actually really enjoying <laughs> this, just being able to think through and kind of disassociate a little bit. And I, I, I read something a long time ago when I was kind of getting into this about how one of the biggest mistakes people make when they try to like become a runner or go to the gym and use the elliptical or whatever is like, it takes them too long to settle into their routine on a daily basis. So, you know, you get there and it's like, Oh, am I going to log into Netflix and watch a show? Or am I going to try right. to find a podcast now or something? And like, so what you find when you, when you sort of get into this habit is like, you're managing it. Like if I have a podcast, I really want to listen to, it makes me want to run more. Like, right. it, it, which is dumb, but it's true. Yeah. And so you end up again, you're, you're solving for a problem you anticipate in case my motivation isn't there to yeah. just be like, what, what can I do to make this a little easier? I, you know, I look at this, like I've been doing a lot of work in the whitetail woods this winter because we've had such a mild winter and it makes me feel so good because I'm, I'm way ahead of where I, I, I knew I had a list of things I'm just going to do, whether I do them in May, June, July, or December, January, February, whatever. And just getting to the point where I'm like, man, I feel so set up for my little girls already in Wisconsin on a lot of stuff and some of the things I want to do. And just those, like getting through those things, it, it helps you so much to get to the next one and the next one and understand what that process is just for thinking about it and planning around it and, and looking for that motivation. Yeah. Yeah. You brought up a couple of things that, um, that I try to do in a lot of my deer hunting world. And a lot of it stems from this book called atomic habits. I know I've talked about, have, have you read that one? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yep. you know, in that one, he just does such a great job of, of, pinpointing some of those key ways to help you, you know, establish a good habit or break a bad habit. And two of the things you mentioned, uh, make it obvious, make it easy, make it rewarding. Like if you can do those things, that really makes it more achievable and, and it's going to help you consistently do the thing you want to do. So whether it's scouting or whether it's shooting your bow more often, or whether it's getting up in the morning and going to the tree stand, like anything you can do ahead of time to make it obvious, to make it rewarding, to make it easier. So like in the case of going out to shoot, like I wrote about this in the Wired Hunt newsletter the other day. I want to shoot more consistently. If you want to shoot more consistently, ways you can do that are, okay, well, you need to trigger something that reminds you, oh, I got to go shoot. So, okay, how about I hang the bow right by the door, in the back door. So every time I walk in and out of the house, I'm reminded, oh shit, I got to shoot today. And then make it easy. Okay, so how about let's make sure that you've got a target right out the back door close so that you don't even need, uh, like, not everybody could do this, but this is just an example. Let's say there's a target right at the back door so you can see that trigger. Okay, there's the bow. I got to shoot today. All right, well, I got the target right there. I've got my arrows leaned up here in the corner. Let me just grab them. I'll get four arrows right now and just check that box, at least get a little bit of a, sh uh, of a, little bit of a session in right now, and then make it rewarding. So there's got to be some way... <laughs> you know, to reward yourself after that. So maybe, man, if I, as long as I get my shots in today, I'm allowed to do X or I don't know what it would be. In the case, you made a good example. Like when you go run, you're allowed to listen to the podcast you want to get caught up on. Like there's different little tricks that we can incorporate to do the things we know we should do, but sometimes they're um, easy to slack on or easy to procrastinate on or whatever it is. Um, and, and I think that the, it's funny, we came to this because of running, right? And I think that's why there's like the whole 
this ties back into what I'm talking about. Like we can learn how to get better at these things, whether it being building good habits or being disciplined or whatever it is in something like running or some other sport you might be doing. And oh, by the way, that's all going to help you as a deer hunter. Yeah. I mean, this, this probably sounds like BS, but I, I firmly believe it. It's like, we are masters of lying to ourselves <laughs> and, you know, and like we're masters of believing it, you know, but once, mm-hmm. once, you know, you get an injury and you can't do something or you lose this spot to hunt or whatever, like you realize like you, it's kind of just on you. Like the, there's so much in life that, you know, there's kind of this mentality out there a lot of times where it's like, I got to blame the boomer generation or I got to, I got to like somebody else. It's somebody else's fault that I am where I am at. Right. Yeah. But when you talk about, and you see this, I mean, you see a lot of shitty stuff in the whitetail world too, where it's like, well, if I had that guy's place or, you know, like if I had those opportunities, it's like, you don't, and it's easy to sort of get into that mentality, but really you just have to work with what you have. And if you're holding yourself accountable and not believing the lies that you want to tell yourself to make life easier, I think good things happen. And it, you know, we're so conditioned to want sort of instant gratification and we're so conditioned to want like that shortcut. But when you do something that there is no way around it, like if you're going to run a a 30 K in the mountains, there's no way around it. Like, I don't care who your parents are. Like, I don't care what genes you're drawing off of. Like you're just, you don't start, you don't go from zero to that quickly. That is a year long. It's like retirement or anything else. Like it's when you learn to hold yourself accountable and appreciate these like baby steps and, and, and building up some discipline, it goes a long way. And of course it feeds hunting. Like that's like, that's like a foundational skill that you have to have to be good at it. Yeah. Is there anything else on the fitness or running side of things in your world that has translated into you having a aha moment as a hunter or that has particularly helped you as a hunter that we haven't covered? Man, I'll tell you what. So I, I started working out like 10 years ago, right when I quit drinking, just cause I, I knew I needed something. I was terrible at it. I was in terrible shape. And what I started doing just, just purely, I, I, I didn't have any reason for it. I started doing cardio and I started lifting weights. And what I have found is I still, there are times where I'm like you, where I'm like, I can't wait to go run tonight. Like it's the right weather and I'm just feeling it. There's a lot of times, like I had this last night where I lifted in the morning and I was like, I had a window where I could do a run before I had to go get my girls. And I did not want to do it. I was like, I just, and and I forced myself to go and the first mile was torture. And after that, I felt great and I, I felt so good doing it. But what where I'm going with this is becoming a runner was really hard. Becoming uh, somebody who lifts weights consistently was pretty hard. But what it feels like now is a freaking vacation compared to my cardio days. And so this thing that at one point in my life was, was very hard to do. You know, it's like, it's humiliating going into a gym where you don't know anybody and you've never lifted and you're, you're super weak. And it's like, you're, you're hyper aware that you're not like a lot of other people. And so now, like now when I look back on that, like how far that I've come, like, I'm like, that's like a, that is not even, it doesn't even feel like a workout the same way going for a six or eight mile run does. And I'm like that. I feel so lucky to get into a spot like that in my life where just to get through that part and now enjoy it so much, because I'll tell you what, dude, when I go hang stands or I'm working in the woods, like I've been cutting down trees like crazy that time in the gym. And you know, it, it, it directly translates to like elk hunting really well, but whitetails, you can do a lot of physical labor out there. And just the, the difference on, uh, you know, how I feel on like a traveling hunt where I have to set up a camp and carry stands in, you know, we're often setting up for camera guys and stuff. So it's like that, that is so beneficial to whitetail hunting that I, I, I didn't, I didn't do it because of that. And I didn't think it would matter at all. And I, I tell you, like, I feel it all the time where I'm like, I'm glad I go do that because it makes this whitetail work so much more tolerable. Yeah. So what do you think is the, um, I don't know if I want to say prescription, but for lack of a better term, what's the prescription here? Is the, is the thing like having a non-hunting physical activity of some kind that that pushes you and that you can have, that you have to build some discipline around and that in some way challenges you? Like, is that, if we had to distill it down to a simplified thing, is that the takeaway here? Like, for us, it's running and you lifting. Um, 
is that kind of like the thing that we've found has been like one of those outside spheres of influence that's really helped us? A hundred percent. I mean, yeah. when you when you just look at the direction of a lot of whitetail hunting, you know, there's side by sides and four wheelers and the easy paths, and we we there there is a there is a way to make whitetail hunting not very physically demanding. Like, and it just is, and it's just a part of it. And we we tend to kind of lean into that and showcase that a lot. There's a lot of money in that, you know, like advertising that. But for a lot of people listening to this who are like, I, I would like to draw that Iowa tag once, or I'd like to travel to Ohio or from Pennsylvania to wherever, the, just this alone of even if you did 20 minutes a day or 30 minutes a day of something is going to make you more successful out there. And what it does for you is, not, you know, it directly translates to being able to do things better, like more efficiently, quieter, um, all that stuff. But you're just more willing to do stuff. You know what I mean? Like you're more willing to like, you know, I, I think about it this way. When you when you go on a public land whitetail hunt somewhere and you've never been there or you haven't been there in four years, usually you get there and you're like, I got a waypoint here. I got a waypoint here. I got a waypoint here. And you're like, I'm going to go in speed scout, speed scout, speed scout, figure something out. And by the time you're like two or three deep, you're like, I, do I want to settle <laughs> or do I want to keep looking for that thing that's just like, this is it. And what I found for myself is I just don't want to settle anymore. And I, it's just easier. If the, the better shape I'm in, the, the easier it is for me to just walk into a spot that's a mile off the road and go, I don't like it. You know, there's cattle in here or whatever. The pond's dry. It's just, it's not right. And just yeah. keep going until you find it. That stuff's important. Yeah. So another, another facet of this pivoting a little bit, and this is, this is a little bit of like a yes. And a lot of these things we've talked about, I used to not allow myself or or thought I should not give myself the time to do some of these things because it was taking away from the deer stuff I should do. Right. Like there's a certain set of folks who would tell you, like, if you're not spending all your time on deer, you're not dedicated enough. You're not going to be as good as I am quote unquote. Right. And, and I found the opposite. I think one of the things, in addition to having some kind of physical habit that does the things we just talked about, I think another suggestion I would offer people within this world is to allow yourself the freedom to chase curiosities, to, to run down rabbit holes. And if it's going to take you away from deer hunting for a little while, if it's a thing that happens in the fall and maybe we'll take some of your time, I would argue, do it. I think that chasing curiosities, chasing new ideas, trying new things, even if in the short term it might take away from your deer focus or your deer time or something, I think in the long run that can help both tangibly and I think intangibly with like your satisfaction too. Um, you know, there's this idea, there's another book I've been reading called Slow Productivity by Kel Newport. And one of the big things he talks about is this importance of seasonality in your life. And his, his argument has basically been, you know, for thousands and thousands of years, human beings evolved with a certain seasonality to how we live, right? When for, you know, tens of thousands of years, we were hunters and gatherers across the board. And there was a, you know, there was an up and down, there was an ebbing to the seasons in which there's times when you were doing a lot and there's times you weren't doing so much. And there's times you did this kind of thing. And then there are times that you did this different kind of thing. And that was what we evolved to do. And then even within the last 10,000 years, when the agricultural um, revolution happened, there was still a certain seasonality for many, 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 many years as we all lived with the ebbs and flows of that agricultural up and down harvest, um, planting, et cetera, winter. But now, last 100, 200 years since the Industrial Revolution, now it's like, you know, there's none of that for most of us. It's it's cranking out every little unit of productivity for as many hours as you can get away with. And that doesn't just apply to work. That applies to our hunting, too, I think. I think a lot of times we look at our deer hunting as if we are a, a factory trying to pump out filled deer tags, right? Um, so let me read a quote from this book about this idea of seasonality and, and kind of it's talking about work, but sub in deer hunting. So he says the problem with the virtual factory, he's talking about knowledge workers, like people walking, working in offices 24 seven, the problem with the virtual factory, however, goes beyond the fact that it makes us unhappy. It's also ineffective. The process of producing value with human brain 
the foundational activity of many knowledge sector roles, can't be forced into a regular, unvarying schedule. Intense periods of cognition must be followed by quieter periods of mental rejuvenation. Energized creative breakthroughs must be supported by the slower incubation of new ideas. So what he's getting at here is if you want to be able to have your best ideas, if you want to be your most creative self, if you want to be your best version of yourself as a deer hunter, someone who's able to be effective, who's able to make those decisions, who's able to problem solve, having these periods of slowdown, having these periods where you try new things, having these periods where you step away from the usual, all of that creates an environment where you do have the space to all of a sudden think of these new things or the space to come back to deer hunting and be rejuvenated and ready to take that next step or to do that next hard thing. Or to, you know, if you came off of learning how to do X, Y, and Z, all of a sudden you come back to deer hunting next week and you're like, Hey, there's this thing I learned while I was learning to surf that actually has a whole lot of applicability here in the deer hunting world. So I think that that's another concept I kind of want to, um, throw out there for us to think about, um, kind of related to that whole idea of like chasing different ideas and curiosities. Um, you know, my son is really getting into climbing like early stages. Um, but he's like really geeking out on like rock climbing. We were just in Joshua tree national park and we kind of went there because he's like really fixated Mm -hmm. on this kind of thing. He's constantly wanting to pretend like he's climbing walls and stuff. And so we were there in the park and climbing boulders and do all this kind of stuff. And I realized like, okay, I'm going to have to learn to do all this stuff. Because like, I just need to make sure he's safe. Like I need to make sure that I know enough to hang with him enough to help him safely navigate this until he's like old enough. Um, So I'm going to be picking up a new hobby and figuring out and taking lessons and doing all that. And I used to say I would use in the past. I said, oh man, you can't have more hobbies. You can't have new things you're learning. But I think now like it's going to be a net benefit. It's going to like push me in new ways. I'm going to learn new things. It's going to challenge me mentally and physically in different ways. And it might take me a couple weekends away from the woods or something. But my argument to you, Tony, is that I think that's actually going to circle back and be good. So Um, uh, just for a second here. So you're telling me and all of the listeners that you're about to become a a rock climber. I wouldn't, I don't know (laughs) if I would call myself a rock climber, but I'm going to learn how to rock climb and attempt it. Yeah. All right, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about that? You seem skeptical. I, well, I'm. I have a weird thing with heights. I I used to be <laughs> super scared of heights, and then climbing into trees over and over and over again. I, I'm not. You know, tree sand heights don't bother me at all. Uh, you know, like being up on the roof of a house, you know, cleaning the gutters, whatever, don't bother me at all. But I have a window where, like, I hit a certain height, and I'm like, this is just not for me. <laughs> <laughs> Everything in my being is like you just you're not supposed to be here. So it's it's curious for me to hear somebody who's like, ah, oh, my little boy wants to rock climb, so I'm gonna just do that. I'm like, man, more power to you, buddy. I, I think I mean it looks amazing. Like I think it's I think that's an amazing activity to get into if you're wired for it. Yeah. I'm just it is not one of, that'd be like if you were like, Hey, <clears throat> I'm gonna just go take a bath with a bunch of spiders. I'd be like, that's exactly the opposite of anything <laughs> I want to do. Yeah, we're all gonna have some limits. Um, yeah, I mean, there's certainly gonna be a max. Like I we were out there in the parks where we were in Joshua Tree for half a week and then Red Rock Canyon for half a week there um in Nevada. And there's people climbing all over the place. And like I'm yep. watching, there's like some people on some of these walls that are like hundreds of feet tall, like they're way up there. And couple times I'm like, okay, that's more than I could ever see myself doing. But like there's people doing something, you know, climbing up there 50, 60, 70 yards up, you know, 100 feet up, 120 feet up. Like I think I could do that. And I can like, it's something I've, I've seen from afar from a long time, like just being active in like the outdoor recreation world. And like, I've always admired that and thought like, that looks really cool. But I'm, you know, a little bit nervous about it and just knew like, it's a little bit intimidating not just like the height stuff, but I mean, like there's all this gear you got to get, you got to learn how to do all this stuff. You got to learn the techniques and then physical, different kind of physical challenge than anything I've done. Um, But I guess having my son who's like really getting into it now has been like just that little extra nudge. And, and now I think I'm just at a place where I'm, I guess I'm just recognizing how much value taking on these new things is giving me. Like I can now look back and see like what the running thing and now the trail running thing has done in my world. And it's like 
added so much. And like before that was like the fly fishing thing coming into my world. And I think all these things, like I know it's all going to circle back and help with my number right. one. And so that's why I guess I'm more willing to push outside of the norm. Cause I see like it's, 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 it's filling the, the cup that then gives me more fuel for the rest of it. If that makes uh, sense. Dude, I, I wholeheartedly endorse you doing as much dangerous stuff as possible. All I see <laughs> is just my chance to move up the totem pole at meat eater just a little <laughs> bit more. <laughs> I wrote you into my will, Tony. Don't worry. <laughs> the keys are all yours. But um, no, I, I, I love it, buddy. It's just not for me. I, there's some dangerous things that I would love to do. And that's not one of them. Well, it doesn't have to be like the curiosity or the new thing doesn't have to be something dangerous, right? You yeah. did a foundations podcast recently about uh, goblin mode, <laughs> about your goblin shelves. I know you thought nobody would see this, Tony, but I did. <laughs> <laughs> can you can you elaborate on what this is and its relevance to our conversation? So where this came from is, and I feel so stupid for kind of not recognizing this in myself or specifically one of my daughters, both of them do this, but one of them's really into this. So when I was last fall, when I was hunting with Steve down in Oklahoma, uh, where we were hunting every, you know, like every once in a while, you'd find like a turtle shell in the woods, you know, obviously from a time when it flooded and this painted turtle died or whatever. And he was picking them up for his kids. And I was picking them up for my kids. Not even, you know, you just see it. You're like, that's cool. Put it in your pack, bring it home. Yeah. And then I, you know, I found a uh, shed antler when we were blood trailing his buck. And what I realized is I gave them to my daughter and she's like, oh, these are so cool. And then we did this meat eater live event, uh, you know, in December and uh, Kevin Murphy brought us swamp rabbit skulls, you know, and I'm like, I don't. As one does. <laughs> right. <laughs> anyway, I throw that in my pack and I bring it home and I'm like, my daughter thought it was so cool. So then we were looking up swamp rabbits and just, you know, whatever. We went down the you know, like rabbit hole. Yeah. So it got me thinking when I, I went into her room for something and I was like, man, she has a lot of st like just stuff from us being out in the outdoors that I didn't know she picked up or agates or fossils or you name it. And I, I read about it just randomly on something and it was like, oh, that's a goblin shelf. And I was like, that is like, it's such a cool concept because we don't think about it. I mean, I'm looking in your, like, you've got a bunch of shed antlers and you know, like, we all kind of have this, most of us have this version of ourselves where we like just find cool stuff and, and keep it. And when you think about that, that not only is that sort of this, the spice of hunting that you don't think about that makes it really cool, right. Or fishing or whatever, like just being outdoors is like, just the unknown, like you might find something that just whatever works for you. You know, you're on the beach and you find a shark's tooth or whatever. But then I started thinking about the times we're out there and how, how easy it is when I'm with my daughters for us to get distracted from the mission and, you know, walk up that, that ravine on the hillside and look for fossils. And then when you're doing that, you're like, oh, here's a deer crossing I never knew was here. And so it kind of just got me thinking, I'm like, man, if you, if you, kind of open yourself up to the curiosity of just not being like, I have to go scout this, 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 and this, and that's my day done or my weekend done. But if you're like, I'm going to just go explore, like, I'm just going to go like may maybe 20% of my mission is just to see this area. I might deer hunt, but being real open to just whatever kind of trips my trigger and, and keeps me out there. And I think that that is like uh, an intangible to a lot of really good hunters is they just, they're just looking at the world out there a little bit different than like, you know, take, take like an over the counter elk hunt. A lot of people go out there and they're like, I'm going to blow this bugle, bugle on every ridge I can until one sounds off. And you might do that the entire 10 days you're there and not get a single response. Mm -hmm. And so you're like, that's a failure because I, I went out with this plan and it didn't work. But if you go out there and you're like, I never get to be in the mountains. You know, like I, I, you know, you know how it is. I make, I spend yeah. maybe 10 days a year in the mountains and I find so much cool stuff, just like plants and, you know, bear claw markings on the trees and whatever. And it, when you kind of go into it that way and you're like, I, you become a part of that environment in a way that's just a, like a little bit different than just like, I got to get in here, kill an elk and get out. And it leads to good stuff. Like just looking for rocks leads to good stuff. And so I yeah. think going goblin mode is 
it's a good idea. <laughs> That's why I wrote about it. <laughs> I, lo- I love it. And I love that it's, it's, it's uh, super nerdy, first off. And the fact that you call it goblin mode and that you talked about it. In that podcast, you even referenced something about Lord of the Rings and Gollum in there, <laughs> which I loved. And it really added to your sci-fi fantasy persona that you're developing here within the Mediator universe. Um, you're becoming like the Gandalf of the Mediator crew, which is kind of interesting. Dude, I'll take um, it. Hey, I, I learned a um, a term for uh, flat earthers the other day. You know what it is? Mm, a flurf. A, a flurf. <laughs> That's great. I like that. Yeah. Um, another part of you that people don't know as much about that I'm kind of interested in unpacking here, in addition to Spaceman, Gandalf, sci-fi, fantasy, Tony, um, is Guitar Tony, Music Man Tony. Um, what's that? What's that about for you? What role does that play? How is that in any kind of way relevant to you as a hunter? It's challenging, man. I am, I am not a natural musician at all. I I can't play by ear. I mean, I can a little bit now, but like a real bass level. Like I, music for me, I, I love music so much, but playing music, writing music is like a, it, it, it is so hard for me. It does not come natural. And so it, it, just as an example, my one daughter who really goes hard on the goblin shelf thing, she's, I'm teaching her guitar right now and she picks it up so much faster than I did. And I just look at it and I'm like, it, it's, it's not effortless. She's trying, but it's just, she's just more naturally inclined to it. And so for me, just loving music and loving the idea of playing guitar, it's, it's one of those things that I can do any, I, I do it almost every day of my life to, to some extent playing the acoustic or whatever, but it is it just kicks my ass <laughs> consistently. Like it is just hard for me. And I, I love that because I know, you know, it's just like, if you look at uh, going out on public land and killing a big buck, you know how hard that is. Like, I don't, I don't care what state you're in. Uh, you know, it's, it's just generally not that easy, yeah. but there are people who can do it consistently and they can they can take different paths to get there. And I always look at that and I go, if if why not me? Right? Like why not me? Like when I see an eight year old on YouTube who can play guitar better than me, I'm like, why not me? And it just it forces me to just keep keep working at it. And I think again, I think that you know, and you alluded to this earlier. We have pretty easy lives, a lot of us. Like if we if we have the free time to hunt whitetails a lot, and you can listen to a podcast a lot, like your life is probably better than a lot of people in the world, you know, but without some level of challenge, like without, without us being like, I'm going to put myself in an uncomfortable situation and just like try to advance myself somehow, you just atrophy. I just believe that. And so like guitar has been one of the most frustrating things for me ever. I mean, it, it literally is like when I first started bow hunting and I was like, I don't know if I'm ever going to kill one. And then, you know, when I finally started doing that, it was like, you're never going to kill a big one. Yeah. You know, like it, it, it was like an almost, almost unattainable thing. And so for guitar, for me, I'm like, if I hear a, you know, a song by Tool or something, I'm like, that sounds so amazing. I'll never be able to play it. But sometimes if you sit down and you work at it, like over time and you build like the parts of it real slow, it becomes something that you can actually do. And I love that about music. Yeah. Yeah, I can see um I can see that being both a way to challenge yourself and also a way to like lose yourself in something, which I think has a lot of value. Like activities in which you are forced not to think about anything else. Is that the case with guitar for you? A hundred percent. I mean, if you if you set out to learn something new, it is a very specific kind of task, right? If you like if I if I have a big writing day where I have some deadlines or something and I, I will hit a wall with writing. I've learned this about myself where I have X amount of words that I can get out and then I got to do something else. And a lot of times I'll go, you know, turn on my electric or I'll go upstairs and play one of my acoustics for just like 20 minutes. And I won't, I won't think about, I'm not learning anything new. I'm playing something I know or just messing around and it is a mindless, it's sort of like 
at certain points during a run where you don't think about the run at all. You're just kind of in your head, zone, like your flow state. Yeah. You're, you're out somewhere else. And for me, I can come back to the computer and write again. And it's just like, it's just like a reset moment. And I, it, it is very important for me because there, there are times where I'll try to push it and it just does not work. Yeah. Yeah. I, I f- absolutely have the same kind of thing for me. It's like when I find myself in that kind of spot where I'm blocked or, or just kind of hitting a wall, it's always like, you got to shake it up physically somehow, like change your body. It changes your mind. And so it might be go for the run or just go out. like yesterday. I just, I, same thing. I was writing and just needed to like get outside and shake myself out. And so I just went, out in the backyard and shot hoops for 15 minutes, just like a kid. There's like a little kid, like shooting hoops and like running around like by myself. And I thought to myself, like anyone who's watching this grown adult at like one in the afternoon and my hoop is lower. Cause my kids are like, my son's like trying to get better at basketball. So it's like a lower hoop. There's a grown man at one o'clock in the afternoon, running around the court shooting. <laughs> like might be a little weird, but, uh, but it was just what I needed. <laughs> To kind of reset the gears, and uh, I was able to sit back down at the desk and and do the thing. I love um, that. I love thinking yeah. about you doing that. <laughs> <laughs> um, back to like, learning something new, though. I wish that I could remember the exact details, but I know I read about some studies that had pointed to the value of being a beginner at something again, and how a lot of folks don't do that. Like they, they just become adults and they learn their thing. And they learn their job and they just do the same thing forever. And they talked about how that really causes you to stagnate in so many ways. But if you can foster a beginner's mindset again, and if you can flex and exercise those like beginner learning muscles, it helps with everything else. So without remembering the the specifics, the basic gist of these studies and the argument is like by consistently tackling new things like This year, I'm going to learn to climb. Next year, I'm going to learn the piano. Three years from now, I'm going to try to learn how to scuba dive. Like by doing that kind of stuff, it, it it like helps your synapses fire and connect differently. It makes future learning. It makes whatever other tasks you're trying to do cognitively. It makes it easier to do those things because there's something special going on in your mind when you're learning something new. And if you're working those muscles and the only way you can work those muscles is by doing the new thing that then translates to everything else. I think like I, I should have found these studies to be able to speak to because that perfectly proves the kind of idea we're discussing here, which is like, man, adding in these new things, learning a new hobby, whatever, it's going to come back and men- make you mentally or physically more prepared to do, in this case, the number one deer hunting focus for a lot of us. Well, um, and I mean, dude, yeah. on that point, really... How many people have you talked to when you're like, oh, I'm going to X state or Y state to hunt? And people are like, why? You have whitetails right here. Yeah. I mean, that happens all the time. Or, you know, I mean, that's a message we've been preaching a long time. When you when you go somewhere new, when you leave the home farm, that's when you grow. Like that's that. And it 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 does something for you that you're just not going to get from that place that you've hunted a lot. And we so often look at it as only a means to go kill something bigger. And not yeah. be in a different environment and not get better at this. And I think that's a huge mistake. Like, I think it, yeah. and I don't, I don't know how, again, like, I don't know how you get people to understand that without just like, go do it. Like, just go see what that's like. And you'll realize, but you can't, you can explain that to somebody, but they're not going to understand it. Like, why, mm-hmm. if I can kill 160s at home, like, why would I go somewhere and hunt 100 inch deer? Like, it doesn't make any sense. And it's like, because that's not what it's about. <laughs> yeah. And that's it's all it's about. But, but uh, number one, that's not what it's about. But number two, my argument to that person, if they want to stay with that mindset, is that it will still help you kill your 160s more effectively yeah. in the future. Yeah. Well, back to that, that idea of like lateral thinking. Like the only way you can get new wells of knowledge to pull from to help you in your original thing, the only way to do that is to put yourself into new situations, new environments. So you can pull these disparate ideas together. The stuff you learn in the big woods, maybe will help you in Iowa. The stuff that you learn in the swamps of Florida very well might help help you in Northern Michigan. Um, I mean, we both experienced that. I've, I've experienced that like that year I did the deer country thing, like really pushing what I tried. Like, man, so many of those things have translated back to my usual in ways I never would have expected. Um, 
there's there's a whole lot that can be learned by putting yourself into these new worlds. Yeah. Well, and that's totally true. And it's also, it sort of highlights some of our blind spots too. Like, like what we think we know. Like I, I, I know that you're heading down to fish down in the ocean here next month. I am too. Yep. And the first time that I ever fished was in the ocean was down in the Keys. And we, my wife and I went on a little vacation and I wasn't going to fish. And when we got there, there was a fishing pier. We walked out on it. There was fish everywhere. And she's like, just go to the tackle shop. Just <laughs> do what you got to do because I know it's coming. She could see you drooling. And, dude, I drove down to that tackle shop and just bought like a cheap combo, whatever. And I, and the guy working there, he said, well, where are you staying? And I told him and he was like, buy these jigs, buy some shrimp, drop them to the bottom. You'll catch fish all day long. I'm like, dude, I know how to fish. Don't worry. <laughs> but I bought the stuff anyway, just whatever. Yeah. So I go out there and I walk out on that pier and I'm like, I know how to catch fish. And so I do what I do and I cast and I caught a barracuda on the first cast. And I was like, see, like, I know what I'm I know doing. What I'm doing. <laughs> and then dude, I could not catch a fish. Just, it was like that one barracuda was waiting there to make me uh -huh. look like I knew what I was doing. And then finally I'm like, I don't know. So I did exactly what he said. And it was nonstop fish after that. And I was like, oh, <laughs> like there's plenty to learn in this stuff that, you know, like we think, we think we know, like I, you know how it is. You talk to people who have a good place to hunt and they kill big deer and they're like, all experts. I, I can do it anywhere. And I'm like, I bet you can't, <laughs> you know, like. Yeah. I, I sat in a tree stand one time filming a show when I was at bow hunter and the camera guy, we were, we were talking about, uh, public land whitetail hunting. I was, it was, you know, this was like 10 years ago and I was on like a good run in a bunch of States. And he was like, yeah, I could do that if I had the time. And I was like, I, and I didn't know that much about him. So as we kind of got to know each other, um, at one point he called his dad who had, they, they hunt in Southwestern Wisconsin. And at that point you could bait. And he was telling his dad to go put out corn by his stands. And I was like, well, do you like, do you hunt anywhere else? He's like, well, no, we, we just hunt down there on the farm. And I was like, I don't think you know what you're talking about then, buddy. Like, but it's, you know, in your head, you're like, well, I killed deer here. So I'm, yeah. I'm a good deer hunter. And man, you know what it's like when you get out of your like comfort zone, it's real easy to suck so much. <laughs> like oh, yeah. it's real easy to be so bad at it, but that's part of the process. Exhibit A and B right here. Um, Mostly yeah, A. It, <laughs> you know, in the screen, in the screen, you're A, just so you know. So uh, <laughs> in my head that you're A, I'm B. Till you fall off a cliff, then I become A. Yeah. <laughs> so with that in mind, um, let's, uh, well, I guess, do you have anything else major within this world of topics that you want to cover that we haven't yet? Or should we like wrap a ball on this? We can wrap her up, buddy. All right. So I feel like I'm going to try to list like the big takeaways I'm remembering here. Like I think number one, it's the big theme here is give yourself permission to do new things, to try new things, to, to let yourself out of the whitetail only box or the whitetail the way you always have box. I think B, tackling new challenges physically and mentally both can push you in new ways, can help you build discipline or or strengthen physical or mental muscles that are going to help you as a deer hunter i think number three it's always keeping whitetail mode kind of active in the back of your mind though when you're doing these things as much as possible so that you're open to these new ideas so that you have the opportunity to have these like lateral thinking moments like i talked about where you can connect the dots between what you're doing as on your smallmouth fishing trip or what you're doing when you're playing chess with your buddy or what you're doing when you're playing the guitar and all of a sudden you have this aha like oh man this is the kind of thing that's actually going to help me as a deer hunter this is this is the way to solve that problem or man that's a different way to approach the my access problem or whatever it might be like you you've got to put yourself into new environments both literally and figuratively to grow to get better we need change we need diversity we need seasonality in our year even to allow yourself like the mental space to come back to deer hunting hot and trot and ready to go. Um, I think those are like my big takeaways from this. And hopefully like my, my thought with all this was that through some of these examples in our own lives, it would either inspire folks to try some new things or help them realize like, Oh, this other stuff I've got 
it is pretty valuable. I should do more of that. Or I can challenge myself in new ways. Or I can convince my wife or husband that this is an okay to keep doing because it's helping in this kind of way. Um, that's what I think we're, we're trying to get at here. Did I miss anything? What else would you add? The, the only thing I would say is any anything like this, just understanding how important baby, I know it's cliched, but baby steps matter. Like you, you're just not going to jump the line, man. Like on, on anything that's worthwhile to do, it just takes, it takes a lot of repetition. Like you, you have to understand that, like whether it's, you know, stacking up whitetail seasons until you finally start getting things right, which is a multi-year deal running, whatever, like just, the, just the act of doing it, like committing to it daily, weekly, whatever. It doesn't have to be, you know, 40 hours a week, like, 20 minutes a day matters a lot to a lot of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Very true. All right, buddy. Well, thanks for uh, joining me for this winding, surprising. I don't know what else you would say to describe this conversation, but uh, <laughs> we we established that you like to, you like to play guitar. You're into the Lord of the Rings. Um, I'm actually what was not. Another? Well, not really you were throwing out lord of the rings references you had this whole thing i'm pretty sure you're pegged now uh anyways we're gonna wrap it up before you can dispute that any further uh, thank you for joining us everyone we appreciate you tuning in take this permission slip to go try new things to explore new areas to uh bring in new ideas back to your whitetail world take advantage of that get out there get outside challenge yourself and until next time stay wired to hunt.